So despite the fact that I have barely left my house in the past 145 days, because that's where we're at now, it's been 145 days since the apocalypse. Um, despite the fact that I barely go anywhere, I'm still super behind on Flosstube. I'm actually still watching people's mania updates, and that's mostly what I've been watching this week is um, people's May videos, because I'm crazy and I can't watch your August floss tube if I haven't seen your May floss tube, because what if I miss a super important plot point? Anyway, my favorite part about all these videos has been um, when the, you know, whoever the floss tuber is talks about their summer plans and says something like, hopefully by August, everything will be back to normal. Oh, we were so young back then. Calendar says August, but it might as well still be April. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Flosstube friends, internet friends, real life friends. Welcome to my little corner of YouTube. My name is Caitlin, and this is where I talk about my cross stitching. If you are new, welcome. Please leave me a comment and let me know where you came from because I'm always curious. If you're returning, thank you so much for coming back. I appreciate it. You'll notice I'm in a different corner of the living room today. Normally I sit over there on the floor, um, but I just thought it would be more comfortable to sit in a chair today. I am now 34 weeks pregnant and sitting on the floor uh, can be rough. As you can also see, um, I am now 100% ready to have this baby because I have checked off getting the mom haircut. I'm ready, check. Um, obligatory bump update if you're interested. If you're not, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to tolerate it. Ooh, back up. There we go. Um, so yeah, 34 weeks. We're still cooking, but uh, getting towards the end of the finish line and I am excited and terrified, but mostly excited. Anyway, you can see in our new space that uh, Lola is with us and she is decked out in her St. Louis Blues attire because uh, even though it's August, we're having the Stanley Cup championships. Like I said, it might as well be April. I know what you're wondering if you've been here before. Caitlin, aren't you from Canada? Yes. Have I ever even been to Missouri? No. Could I tell you where Missouri is on a map? Probably not. Um, but I have been a huge Blues fan since I was a young child and uh, probably always will be. And uh, we won our first Stanley Cup last year and let's go two for two, huh? Okay, so what has been going on? Quick life update. The last time I saw you guys was the end of May, um, the last couple days of May there. So I was pretty burnt out in June. I did do some stitching and I did record a short video of what I did in June, but I had a technical issue and before I could resolve it, we were leaving to go on vacation, and then we were on vacation for like three weeks. A little weird that we took a vacation from being on furlough, I know. <laughs> but it was a trip we had previously planned with my in-laws in December. We went out to Long Island, um, stayed in Airbnb for about three weeks, and spent a lot of time at the beach. We were very responsible and socially distanced, and we didn't go into any stores or shops or restaurants. Um, we basically just... We're at the Airbnb, we're at the beach within walking distance of the Airbnb, and it was fantastic. It was so nice to see like the inside of a different home. <laughs> and uh, that was the first time we had seen anyone other than each other in like 120 days or something, um, 100 and some odd days. It was, it was really nice to like see my in-laws and do something a little bit different. So. In any case, I figured I would just record after we got back from vacation and then, you know, we got back kind of mid-July and had some things going on around the house and then all of a sudden it's August. <laughs> so here I am. So life-wise, not much going on. We're both still out of work. Um, if you're new here, my husband and I both work in film and TV in New York City which um, all of film and TV pretty much nationwide was shut down uh, around March 13th. 
July 20th, I think, the mayor gave the go-ahead for New York City Productions to start back up. A couple shows have started. They started the last week of July. There are some shows that started this week, the first week of August. But it's still kind of not everyone's diving in right away. So that's been weird. I've always been somebody who works and uh, this is the longest time I've had off in like basically since becoming an adult. <laughs> it's been very strange and um, I am adjusting. But uh, yeah, so that's what's going on with us life-wise. I mean, we're just trying to find the positive and enjoy this like extra time together that wouldn't have existed otherwise and um, I guess count our blessings and uh, I don't know I'm trying to stitch a lot <laughs> so speaking of stitching let's talk about it because that's what you're here for <laughs> um, so like I said I was a little bit burnt out at the beginning of June so June was like kind of a slow month for me stitching wise and um, July kind of was too. I'm hoping August will be more productive. So I don't have a whole lot to show you for having been gone for two months, but I do have some things. So let's start with FFOs. So I have FFO'd three things since I've seen you last. Um, the first of which, I have one of these little light boards here. Um, I FFO'd this little raccoon ornament This is from Etsy. I will, um, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the shop right now. I will put it somewhere here on the screen and link it below. I stitched this, I think, last year. Um, and it was a quick stitch. He's super cute. This is stitched on 32 count, uh, PT Point, Belfast by Zweigart in the blue colorway. And I just put a little Christmassy fabric on the back. It's not super straight. And some red rickrack trim. Um, he turned out okay. I tried to sew this um, as like a round ornament. Sewing circles is really hard. I am not ready for that. So I ripped it out and then just laced it around a couple, around some cardboard and glued some fabric on the back. But I'm super, super jazzed with how he turned out. He's adorable. I also FFO'd um, my two soda stitches, my ice cats and my bum bears. Um, they're already hanging on the wall. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert either a photo or a video of them here. Okay, I just wanted to quickly show you guys my framed soda stitch ice cats. So you can see I'm such a bad measurer. I always measure things wrong, which is crazy because it's an important part of my job. <laughs> You can see that the frame is slightly too small on the edges. So this cat's getting cut off a little bit. And then this cat's getting cut off just a little bit. I'm okay with it. I feel like in this situation, done is better than perfect because this has been sitting in my finish box for so long. I stitched this in 2016 or 17 cross-stitch finish line had a round robin, so I stitched the bottom of all these cats and then passed it along to the five other members um, of my round robin group, and they all stitched a cat as well. So this frame is from Art to Frames. I will link them below. I like using them. They're the thing I like the most about them is that they're local to me. I can literally walk to their warehouse to pick up a frame so I don't have to pay for shipping and that's a little bit more eco-friendly and also I like supporting a local business. Um, they're, but they're an online website. They're, they have a website online and they'll ship pretty much anywhere I think. I think this frame costs $27 which I think is a good price for a strange size. You know it's about what you would spend for a off the wall frame from like Target or Michaels maybe, maybe a little less. Um, the price is kind of reflected in the quality, you know, like it's not the most, I probably wouldn't use them, you know, to frame like a Chatelaine. 
Um, but overall, I think their frames are pretty good quality for the price and it's super convenient for my location. And I like that they're kind of like they're local and you know, I like the price point. They, um, I'm not going to take it off the wall to show you, but these frames don't come with a back. So if you want to back your frame with paper or something, you have to do it yourself. You have to attach the hardware yourself. Um, they do come with a acid-free foam board that you can use to lace um, your project on. I usually just lace the project on the board that comes with the frame. But you need to specify when you check out that you want the foam board and otherwise they'll just send you basic cardboard. Um, so, you know, it's part of, it's part of getting a, a discount product, I guess, right? The one thing I'm not super jazzed about, and it's the same with the other frame, is that this was listed as white, but, um, you know, when compared to the molding, um, it's really more of an off-white. It's kind of like closer to ECRU than V5200 which I'm okay with on this one. Here's the Bum Bears. Um, this is the same the same exact frame as the, the one I used for Ice Cats. Um, so again, it's, it's more off-white than white. I'm, I'm considering painting these frames with the same color we use for the trim in the room, just because I feel like next to the molding and these white shelves, it's super obvious that this is off-white. Like, these look yellow, not white. I don't know. My husband really likes that the frames are not white because we have so much other white stuff in the room. You know, we have, like, this white chair rail and these white shelves. But I feel like it bothers me that this frame is yellow and the fabric is mostly yellow. Let me know what you think. Should I paint them a brighter white? It probably wouldn't take very long. Um, I added a mat with this project to kind of set it off a little bit from the frame. I really like how it looks. I'm super, super happy with how this turned out. I put this kind of in a place of honor so I, um, I can see this every time I enter the room or come up the stairs from the kitchen. It's, it's right there in my face. I'm gonna look at this every day. Um, I'm going to make my child take this to college with them. Forgot to sign it. Whoops. So there's that. There is the completed bum bears. So the last thing I have like fully finished is I finished a quilt for the baby's room. Um, it's kind of hard to show you the whole thing on camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a picture here of me holding it up. And then I'll kind of just show you a little bit of it here. Um, so this is the French macaroon pattern from Modern Handicraft, Modern Handcraft. Um, I'll link below where you can buy it. It was, the piecing was relatively easy, but, um, I struggled a lot putting this through my little machine. I just have a little brother CSI, which by the way, is a really good machine for if you're a beginner sewer or you want to learn to sew. They're usually on sale around Black Friday or Christmas at like Walmart or Joann's. Um, I think I paid like $100 or less for mine. And it has quite a few bells and whistles, but it's super easy to use. Um, but I really struggled putting something of this size through to quilt. It started to get really difficult to manipulate and really heavy. And... Um, You know, I can see why people like rent out time on long arms and stuff. It's not impossible to do a baby quilt on a brother, but I think if I do another quilt on that machine, it's going to have to be um, a quilt as you go style where you quilt the blocks and then assemble the blocks because it was, it was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was like 90 degrees every day I was working on this. And I was so, like, the fabric was just everywhere. I don't know. Um, I did some like teal bind, so I, the binding is teal, and then on the back I have this, um, if you can see, this like blue gingham fabric, which I picked to match the tablecloth in uh, Soda Stitch. 
have the soda stitch, stitch sweet bears. So I'm excited about it, but I'm, I'm super happy with how this turned out. Um, my binding is a little sloppy on the back. It looks great on the front, but on the back, it's like super crooked. So if anyone has any binding tips, um, I would love to hear them. Is that like, do you just not worry about the backs of your quilts? Like you don't worry about the backs of your cross stitch? Should I be, I did this on the machine. Should I be hand binding it to make it look neater? I don't know. Um, let me know if you got tips. So um, finishes, I do have some finishes to show you. I have been keeping things mostly monogamous since Mania. I'm really liking just working on one thing until it's finished. Um, I'm getting a lot of satisfaction from that. Um, I, so from the beginning of June until when we left on vacation, I decided to focus primarily on Fabulous Woman. Um, that is the Clouds Factory Fabulous Woman in History Stitch Along from 2017. I haven't finished the whole thing yet, but I have finished five women since I saw you last. And um, I'm counting each of these women as a finish in your whips and just in general. So technically they're five finishes, even though the project's not finished, if you follow. So I will insert a picture here of where you saw it last time. And then here is the whole thing now. So since I saw you last, I have finished Frida, um, R, R. Levy Montalacini, that's not how you pronounce it, <laughs> not even close, uh, and Rosa Parks, and I did them all as charted. And then I came up here and I made some changes. Okay, Julie, are you sitting down? Don't get upset. Julie, Kansas City girl in a Colorado world. Don't hate me. Don't thumbs down me. I'm really sorry. I replaced Jane Austen. And I, I don't have a problem with Jane Austen. It's not like she was like a secret Nazi like Coco Chanel was. I do not have a problem with her. I just really wanted to include um, this particular woman in my project. And this was the spot she had to go chronologically. So um, I wanted to include at least one Canadian in here. So I decided to include... Laura Secord. Uh -huh. Closer for you to see. So Laura Secord, if you don't know, um, was a woman who lived in Upper Canada during the early 1800s. Um, I will link below her Heritage Minutes. Um, Heritage Minutes were 30 second to 60 second long PSAs that were made by the Canadian government and that played on TV during commercial breaks in the 90s. Uh, they're essentially just little clips about important events in Canadian history that the government thought you should know about. And they were actually, they actually had pretty high production value for PSAs. So I'll link her Heritage Minute below so you can check that out, but I'll also tell you about her. So she, um, she lived in Upper Canada during the War of 1812 you're right, this is a Union Jack. It's not a Canadian flag. That is because Canada um, didn't really exist as a country during the War of 1812. It was still a British colony. Um, and uh, the Canadian flag obviously didn't exist at that time. It didn't really actually exist until like the 60s. Um, so during 1812, the Union Jack would be the flag that was flown. So Laura Secord, her family owned a tavern and there were American soldiers um, stationed at or staying at this tavern um, where she was working and she overheard an American officer talking about plans to kind of sneak attack on the British army and ambush them and she was like oh my god I gotta warn them so she traveled all day and all night through the super harsh untamed Ontario brush on foot she like ran the whole way to the British forces to warn them that the Americans were coming. And so the British forces were not surprised and way less people died than would have. So um, I included with her this cow because in some, in some accounts, she brought a cow with her as kind of a distraction in case she came across American troops. 
I don't know how true that is. There's a lot of debate about how true the whole story is. Um, but also, you know, she didn't get recognition for most of her life because history is written by men. <laughs> uh, so I believe she did it. I don't know if she had a cow or not, but I wanted to put something there. And so I charted this cow. Um, I charted her based off Harriet Tubman's design, um, the shawl and the dress. And I think uh, the cap is the same cap that was used in Jane Austen. I gave her a red shawl, white cap, and white dress, you know, Canadian colors. And then I decided I wanted to make some changes to Sacagawea. I didn't want to include Lewis slash Clark over here, who was also charted in a midget way. I, it's like, I feel like they didn't want to include men in the chart, and then so they charted them smaller to try and not make them the focus of the block, but then it just looks like, it was like the same problem with Mark Anthony. They just look like weird midgets standing next to these women. And then also they only put one person in to represent Lewis and Clark. And uh, I just didn't want them in there. So I replaced them with some more trees and a canoe. And then I decided to connect uh, Sacagawea's river into Laura Secord's block because Laura Secord also had to like wade across the river. So um, even though they're, they existed at different uh different times in different areas of North America, I connected their blocks. So that's what I did. So yeah, so five, I complete, so that's five more women on this chart complete. I'm more than halfway done. So that's the PhD achieved in this project. I think I have 11 left to go. And I'm hoping to get back to this project at some point this month. I actually, I only have to finish four more Year of Whips projects to complete the challenge. Um, so since each of these women counts as a Year of Whip, I really only need to finish four more of them to technically complete the challenge, which is awesome because I have never ever finished Year of Whips on time. And this year I think I'm going to finish mad early. Um, theoretically I could have Year of Whips complete before September which uh, we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but that's exciting, right? So PhD in that project, five women complete. The next finish I have to show you, this was a mania start. I took this project on vacation with me because it was an in-hand project. And I think in-hand projects are easier to bring when you're going on vacation with other people. I just, they're easier to pick up and put down, like trying to deal with a few snap while also talking uh, to the people you're vacationing with is kind of a lot. So anyway, the, the, that project is The Personal is Political, designed by our own Bendy Stitchy Michelle Get Garrett. I started this in May for Mania, and I didn't have the called for fabric or all of the called for colors, so you can check out my conversion in my previous video, or maybe I'll just list it below. Um, in any case, I stitched this on a scrap of 32 count deep magenta by Zweigart. This isn't showing up super true to color. It's it's basically Barbie pink. It's Barbie pink fabric. I love it. Um, down here, this this border should extend a little bit further, and there was a line of over one stitching that said, "It always has been." Basically, I got to here in the border and was like, "I'm done. I want to finish. I need to finish uh, for the month of July, or the month of June." Um, so. I just decided to leave out the over one stitching and uh, I connected the border across and called it a day. I did put my initials in over one there. So I think um, I use the green is Winter Garden by Color and Cotton. The light pink is Chiffon by Color and Cotton. And then I think the DMCs are the called for ones or close to it. But you can check that out in my Mania vlog. So in June, um, Several floss tubers were um, doing this diversity inclusion and inclusion sale, which started on Juneteenth, and I really wanted to participate. I guess I theoretically could have kept working on Fabulous Women for that sale because I have converted some of the white women to women of color, but I was kind of bored of that project by that point. I needed a break, and uh, I was looking through my stash, and I didn't really have anything else that fit. 
And then luckily I stumbled across this woman on Instagram. Um, her IG handle and her website are called Creative Shack. Um, it's creative with the number eight. I will link her below. She does really cool embroidery designs. Um, and she also teaches embroidery classes and punch needle classes. And she sells some punch needle designs. Um, but she was giving away this design as a freebie on her website. And so I'll link you to her site and I think it's still free. Um, she just asks that if you complete it, that you like tag her on Instagram so that she can share it. But um, it's a beautiful design and I've seen some really beautiful renditions of it. But uh, so this is my version of it. So um, I just stitched this on. I had a scrap of quilting cotton, this aqua color. Uh, I think it's from Michael's. Um, this is probably only the second or third embroidery project I've done. I've done some little like dimensions kits, but this is the first one I did where I had to trace onto the fabric after printing it out. Um, and I pulled all my own colors from my floss box. Um, so I, I pulled these jewel tones. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can, I didn't write down. <laughs> I don't think I wrote down what DMCs they were, but if you really want to know, ask me and I'll let you know. Um, so I pulled all my own colors and the stitches used are um, split stitch, uh, satin stitch and French knots and that's it. So it was pretty um, approachable as an embroidery project because French knots I'd done, uh, split stitch was easy to learn and satin stitch I think I've done before. So my satin stitch still needs work. I, so I'm used to with cross stitch with doing French knots last and somebody told me later what I should have done is I should have done the French knots first and then satin stitched around them here um, because you can see focus focus um, you can see where the French knots came through that I kind of split the stitches a little bit and it doesn't look as good here so I should have done the French knots first and the satin stitches around them but I was just used to doing them last from cross stitch so I didn't know that um, I think her lips turned out really nice and her eyebrow turned out pretty good and her eyelashes um, my leaves and my flowers need some work, but um, overall, I'm like super happy with how this project turned out. And I think I'm going to make this into a cushion or something. I don't know. I just love the bright colors. It needs an iron for sure. And I'm thinking I'm going to try and dabble in a little more embroidery this year if I can. It's a different process than cross stitch, right? It's it's like in some ways it's more difficult because you don't have this grid to follow but in other ways it's super kind of like freeing um to not be stuck within that grid and you know the it, it was easier to work with mistakes and kind of just build off them or cover them them up whereas in cross stitch you often just have to rip the mistake out and redo it so but you can you know if you like have a crappy satin stitch you can satin stitch over it i think maybe you're not supposed to i don't know um but it was it was like a different kind of process and i found it weirdly relaxing um in some ways compared to cross stitch which is already pretty relaxing i don't know if that makes sense but i'm gonna try and do some more embroidery this year because i'm really liking um i'm really liking learning it um so the last finish i have for you I started this after we got back from vacation and finished it in about a week. It was a freebie that Whistle Stop Stitcher put out for the 4th of July. I don't know if it has a name. If it does, I'll write it down here. Um, but I just, I kind of just am calling it my 4th of July freebie project. Um, so uh, it says, in the face of impossible odds, people who love their country can change it, um, which is a Barack Obama quote. There was a place down here to write his name Barack Obama over one but for whatever reason I think it's because I was using white floss on a darker fabric I put it in and ripped it out a hundred times I couldn't get it to look right I couldn't get it to show up I tried it in different colors it just wasn't working so I decided to leave it off the project I know who said it if anybody asks me I'll tell them I feel I feel okay with it so um yeah, so I'm super happy with how this turned out. This, I used um, this piece of Picture This Plus Mirage, which is this kind of like dappled gray, um, B5200. I can't remember the blue. It's like one of the 800 DMCs. And then the red is a 
old variegated DMC color. Um, I believe it's number 72 that I had kind of in my stash from like my grandma's floss. Um, so it's an older color. I'm not sure if it's still available, but it's this like very subtle um, variegated bright to dark red. And I like how that turned out. Okay, that's it for finishes. Let's talk whips. So in June, I think the first weekend in June, I started a sale with Jenny, the long dog stitcher, Candace, slob lover stitches, and seems so vintage, who doesn't have floss to you, but is on Instagram. And uh, uh, I think Shelly Kiek stitch also is in, is participating in the sale. I think that's everybody. If you if you want to participate or you are participating, comment below so I know so and like leave your Instagram so I can follow your progress. Um, but we started the uh, Baron Traditions Needles and Pins sampler together. And the sampler says, "Needles and pins, needles and pins. When a man marries, his trouble begins." Certainly did for my husband. So I have a small start on this. I, of course, I initiated the sale and sent people charts and then I never bothered to check to see if I had the DMC for the project and even though I have a gazillion skeins of DMC somehow every time I start something new I'm missing about 20 colors so I had to I worked on this as much as I could before I had to put in an order for floss and haven't picked it up since but so this is this is my start that's this part of the border up here this strawberry I'm stitching this on 32 count Wexford linen um, by Silk Weaver in the colorway Autumn Harvest. It's not showing up very well on camera, but it's this like really lovely beige with kind of like darker brown, some red tone modeling. Candace is doing hers on blue fabric and I'm super jealous. I didn't think of that. It looks really good. And I think Jenny's changing her colors as well. I'm gonna do the call for colors, but I'm gonna make some changes. Um, to the people up here. This dog's gonna become a couple cats. I'll probably not put this tree in. So I'll do both our cats. Um, this man's gonna get a beard because my husband has a beard. This, uh, whatever this is, is gonna become some cake. And uh, I might make some adjustments to the lady as well. So those are my plans for that. Also, since I've seen you last, I have restarted, finally, Coffee Quaker. I started this when this came out in market, market 2017. I ordered it immediately, started it immediately um, with my own color conversion. There was a Facebook group, everybody was converting colors. I was like, call for colors aren't good enough for me. I had this kitchen at the time that was like blue, red, yellow, super bright colors. So I was using this blue fabric and like reds and yellows. I'll insert a picture here of where it was the last time you saw it. Those colors were not working. My tastes have changed. My home has changed. They weren't really working anyway. That's why I put it away. I was getting frustrated. So I decided to restart it this year um, with like a new color conversion. I probably should have just ordered the call for colors because if I had, it would be done by now because I wouldn't have to be thinking about my conversion and then overthinking and lying awake at night wondering if these colors are working together. I'm still really not sure if they are, but it definitely definitely looks so, so, so much better than my last attempt. So I think I'm headed in the right direction. So um, I've restarted it. I've completed about five motifs. I almost have six done. And this is what I have so far. So this is 36 count linen from Zweigart in the colorway Stone Gray. Um, I have been pulling colors from my co color and cotton stash kind of as I go, and I am much, much happier with how this is looking together. Um, there's still been some ripping and restitching. You know, I, I redid this motif and this motif um, a couple times before I settled on a color I liked. <clears throat> um, the green is weathered bronze. Um, the white, the light blue is dove gray, color and cotton. This is battleship blue, I'm pretty sure. Um, the 
brown color is Barnwood, which is one of my favorite, favorite color in cottons. It's like a purpley brown, super rich and chocolatey looking. Same over here. And then um, this darker color here is a limited edition color and cotton color from the Halloween box a couple of years ago, Witching Hour. Oops. Which is this like dark purpley blue. So I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. Let's see if I can get this behind this if this will help you see the blue a little bit better. That light blue isn't showing up very well on camera, but it looks pretty good in person. Um, so I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. I've got almost six motifs done. My goal for this for the year was to restart it and complete six motifs. Um, I have five complete and five and a half complete. So I should be able to hit that goal by the end of the year. And the last whip I have to show you that I have been working on this week that I'm so, so close to finishing. I was hoping I would have it finished today to show you, but no such luck. I think I can finish it this evening if I can get this video wrapped up soon. So um, this is Turn Turn by the Noteworthy Needle. I don't know if this chart is available for purchase yet. I took it as a class with Carmen Broadway Stitcher and um, Debbie Stitch the Stash. We took it as a class at Needleworkers. I think that was the first time we all met in person, like IRL. Um, I think it was November 2018. So it's coming up on its second birthday, I think. First or second birthday. Um, I'm very close to finishing this. If I have it, I'll insert a picture here of the last time you saw it. And here we are now. So all I have left is you see this white over here that this tree has some snow. Where's my board? So this tree over here um, has some snow on it and this there's like a snow below it. I just have to mirror that over here. So I have a little bit of white to do around the tree and a little bit of white to do across here. Um, maybe like 200 stitches of B5200 left and I will be done. So super close, hoping to finish this tonight or tomorrow. Maybe by the time I have this video edited, it'll be done. And if so, here's a picture. I don't think I will FFO it this year. So when this is complete, it's basically a pin cushion and then you can turn the pin cushion to reflect the change of seasons. The, in the class, we didn't do any pre-stitching. We got the kit in the class, and in the class, she taught us how to do the finishing. I do have the finishing instructions. I did not take enough notes in the class, and I was looking over them last night, and I'm, I think I know what to do, but I'm not really sure. It's definitely something that's going to take some, like, sitting down and looking at and figuring out. And once I get going, I should be able to finish it within a couple of weeks, but I don't know if I'm going to get to that this year. I really kind of doubt it. I, I just kind of would rather spend that time finishing whips than FFOing this, but we'll see. I will feel good. It will feel good to get the stitching done in any case, because this project has been kicking around a little too long. Haven't they all? They've all been kicking around a little too long. Okay. So that's it for whips. Plans wise, like I said, I only need to complete four more Year of Whips projects to complete the challenge. And I think I can totally do it. And I'm, I would love to have that challenge complete by September 1st. I think it's totally manageable. Turn, turn, I can have finished today or tomorrow. And then I just need to finish three more things. And I think I have enough projects that are close enough that I can do it. So that's going to be my August goal to finish four year books projects so that I can call that done, challenge complete, and then um, hopefully get that done by September 1st so that that challenge can be complete for the year, right? Because once the baby gets here, I don't know how much stitching time I'm gonna have, but I'm so close, I can taste it. I would love, love to just have one year where I complete year of whips. And I think that this year could be the year. 
thanks coronavirus. Um, so I think that's going to be my plan for August is to, to concentrate on your whips and try and get that challenge complete. So that's it for plans. Stash wise, I haven't bought anything except for DMC. So I don't really have any retirement planning to share with you this time around. I do have a couple books I want to talk about. But that's all I have in terms of stitching and crafting. So if that's what you're into and you're not interested in books, thank you so much for stopping by. I will see you at the beginning of September. I hope. Fingers crossed. So if you are interested in books, um, I just want to talk about what I've read since May really quickly. I have read seven books since May, so I will try and keep this short and sweet and concise. But I have a lot of feelings about these books and I really just need to tell somebody. So I'll try and keep it short and sweet. If you've read these and want to talk about them, please, please hit me up in the comments because I would love to hear what you think. Um, especially about one of them in particular. I just have so many questions. So the first thing I read since May was Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. This was an NP recommendation and it's a magical realism fairy tale style story. What I liked about this book is that it features three strong female characters and it's about how their three stories kind of intertwine. So we have our main character Miriam. She is the daughter of a moneylender. She lives in a small village. They're the only Jewish family in the village. So there's kind of like a feeling, there's, there's a little bit of anti-Semitism towards them, a little bit of other th otherness in terms of how the villagers treat them. So because of that, her father doesn't want to push too hard to get his debts paid back, basically because he's a little bit afraid of the townspeople. One winter, their family is super starving and Miriam sees these families that they've lent money to doing okay and her family is literally starving. So she decides, you know what, I'm taking over the business, I'm going to collect her debts. So she goes out and starts collecting debts on behalf of her father and she does a really good job of it and her family starts earning an income and she basically gets this reputation of being able to turn silver into gold. Not literally through magic but just because she's a good a good businesswoman. So kind of parallel to this village is a kingdom of magical people called the Staric. At one point, the, the king of the Staric learns of Miriam's reputation of being able to turn silver into gold. And he takes it literally. He thinks she's magical. So he basically employs her or requests for her to turn his silver into gold, which is a little bit of a challenge for Miriam because she doesn't actually have any magical powers to turn silver into gold, but he thinks he does. He thinks she does. So she has to kind of figure it out. In order to figure out how to solve this problem, she enlists the help of a peasant girl named Wanda. Wanda comes from a rough home situation. Her she has younger brothers she needs to take care of. Her mother is dead. Her father is a horrible human being who basically wants to sell her off into slavery to pay off his debts. So um, she kind of gets roped into this, this quest with Miriam. And then our third character is Irina, who is the daughter of a really unlikable Lord character who basically wants to use his daughter as he wants to marry her off to gain higher political standing. So all three women, their stories are kind of tangled together throughout the novel. They all have different kind of paths or quests that they're on, but they all are tangled together. The next book I read was The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. I read this book in June and I still don't know how I feel about it. It was a total mind warp. I had a complete love-hate affair with the book the whole time I was reading it, and it's a long book. So there was a lot of times where I was so mesmerized by the writing, I couldn't put it down. And then there was just as many times where I couldn't stand it and wanted to throw it out. The whole time I was reading it, I kept turning to my husband and being like, I don't know. I don't know. Do I hate this book? Do I love this book? If you have read this, please comment below because I need to talk to somebody about it. So what is this book about? If I had to give you a general theme for this book or subcategory, I would call it rich white people who are sad. 
that is what this book is about. Rich white people who are sad. More specifically, our story is about Theo, who is a rich kid who lives in Manhattan. His father has left him and his mother alone um, and abandoned them, kind of. One day, he is out with his mother, and there is a terrorist attack, and his mother is killed. And that's kind of where our story starts. So it's, it's a very long book, and it's basically Theo's coming-of-age story. This, his mother's death happens in like middle school. And from there, you know, because his father isn't in the picture, he's bounced around kind of to different home situations, all of which are very different. So there are parts of this novel that are so well written, I literally couldn't put it down because I was completely mesmerized. Um, there are some sections where Theo is making really poor choices, or he's having panic attacks or anxiety attacks, you know, because he has PTSD from being in a terrorist attack. And they were so well written that they gave me severe anxiety just reading them because I was totally immersed. I had to take frequent breaks to step away from this book because the writing was so good that I was like so invested in the outcome that was making me so anxious. So I would have to put the book down and collect myself. I mean, because it was such good writing, but also that's not a super pleasant experience to have when you're reading. Yet there are other parts of this novel that are so overloaded with unnecessary detail, just like pages and paragraphs and whole chapters that read like writing exercises that the author was using for character development that should have just been edited out of the book. Um, and those parts were totally insufferable, so I had to put the book down out of boredom then as well. This is a very long book, so it's a commitment to read it. And when you are constantly having to take breaks, either because it's so good it's making you anxious or because it's so bad you're bored to tears, it takes forever to read it. I feel like it took me the entire month of June to read it and I don't even know if I liked reading it. So if you've read The Goldfinch, please comment below and tell me what you thought. People, like, when this book came out, people talked as if it was the greatest book of all time. I don't think so. Would the greatest book of all time make me feel this way? Maybe that's what makes it great. I don't know. The next thing I read was The Ninth House, which is by Lee Bardugo. I didn't realize when I picked this up that this is the first book in a series and the next books aren't written yet. So it ends on a bit of a cliffhanger and the, the, the second book isn't out yet. So if that's something that bothers you, don't read it. I kind of feel okay with not reading the rest of the series. I enjoyed the book, but I wasn't so into it that I feel robbed by the next book not being out. Ninth House is a, another magical realism book. It was a Julie recommendation. It's about this girl, Alex, who goes to Yale. And she is basically part of a secret society that helps keep other secret societies in check as they perform magic. There is a murder that happens and a mystery to be solved that she has to solve on her own because the police don't believe her. And all of this she has to kind of balance while also not flunking out of Yale and performing her secret society duties. I enjoyed the book. The mystery was compelling. There was enough closure at the end that it didn't bother me too much that I don't have the second book right there to read. I don't know. I'd give it a solid three out of five. I liked it. If you like magical realism, if you know, young adult kind of stuff, give it a try. The next thing I read was a bit of a downer, but a very important read. If you are Canadian, if you live in Ontario, put this on your must read list. I read Seven Fallen Feathers by Tanya Talaga. I'm probably totally butchering that name. I'm sorry, Tanya. This is a nonfiction book. It is about missing and murdered indigenous kids in the Thunder Bay area of Ontario. I learned a lot reading this book. You know, growing up in Canada, we heard a little bit about residential schools and high school, not a whole lot. This book isn't really about residential schools. It's kind of about what happened 
post the closing of residential schools. Residential schools were basically where the Canadian government, this happened in the US as well, but in the United States, I think they were referred to as boarding schools, which is like a slightly fancier name for what they were. Basically, the Canadian government would take children away from Indigenous families, put them in these residential schools where the kids were forced to live. The situations were super horrible. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough clothing. There was rampant abuse. It was, they were awful places. The last residential school, I think, in Canada closed in the 90s, maybe 1995. But after these schools were closed, there was basically in Ontario no plan put in place for where kids would now go to school. So basically, due to a bunch of horrible things that happened in history, such as unfair treaties by the Canadian government, Indigenous populations in Ontario and across Canada have kind of been pushed to the outskirts. So in the Northern Ontario area, there, the Indigenous community lives so far away from the white communities that their kids basically need to fly into Thunder Bay in order to go to high school. When the Canadian government closed residential schools, the Ontario government didn't put anything in their place in these Indigenous communities. So kids were still having to leave home to go away to school. So in, in the Thunder Bay area, kids were coming in from Indigenous communities further north and staying at boarding houses in order to go to high school because that was the only place close to them where they could go to high school. The name Seven Fallen Feathers comes from seven children in the Thunder Bay area who were killed while being away from home, going to school in Thunder Bay. Many of them went to the same school. A lot of the deaths were suspicious. The Thunder Bay police did not adequately look into the deaths of these kids or investigate them. The book talks a little bit about an inquest into the police department that happened. It talks about the history of residential schools. It talks about each of these kids and their stories in detail. It is not an uplifting read, but it is an important read. And I highly recommend it, especially if you live in Ontario. I think there's, there's stuff in this book that I didn't know about. And it's not stuff that happened in my parents' generation. Like, this is my generation. These are people who were killed in the 90s, in the 2000s. You know, these are people who could have been my age or are younger. And um, this is clearly an ongoing problem that isn't being addressed. So the next thing I read was the first two books in the Maisie Dobbs series. The first one is called Maisie Dobbs, and the second one is called Birds of a Feather. I think this is like um, a 15 book series or something like that. There's a whole slew of these books about this main character, Maisie Dobbs, and I found them really light, uplifting, enjoyable. If you like mysteries, but you don't want anything too scary or too violent, if you like Nancy Drew and Downton Abbey, this is a good series for you. Our main character, Maisie Dobbs, is a private investigator in kind of post-World War I, 1920s London. In both the first and second book, she's solving murder mysteries. So they are serious crimes, but these books are kind of light in the sense that, you know, our main character is pleasant. Nothing really goes wrong for her. She's able to follow the clues because she's a super smart lady, but it's not, um, she's never, you never feel like she is in any real danger. It just, Things don't feel severe or serious in the sense that they do with like a Stephen King novel. If you like mysteries but you don't want to read anything heavy right now because the world is on fire, I totally get that. This is a good book for pandemic times. Okay, and the last book, I just finished this yesterday. I read it in like a day and a half. It was so good. This was an Ingeborg recommendation, uh, Washington Black by Oh my gosh, I'm going to totally butcher this. I'm so sorry. Ezi Ejugan. I'm going to write it below. This book was great. It's a Canadian book. It's the story of a slave boy named Washington Black 
He was born and raised on a plantation in Barbados. And through kind of a series of events, he escapes the plantation and makes his way to North America. And then from there, we follow his life as he travels the world. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it for you, but I thought it was a very well-written, powerful book. I listened to the audiobook and the narrator was fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, it's available in your library app. All right. I, that's all I got to say about books. I think I covered all my main points. If you have read any of those or you want to, or you have anything to say about any of those books, please comment below, especially if you've read The Goldfinch. Oh my God, if you've read The Goldfinch, please message me. So um, my life's changing. My neighbors are home. Stuff. My husband's on his way home. I got to wrap this up, but it has been nice catching up with you guys. I hope I will get one more video in before um, this kid comes into the world. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that I will see you the first week of September with some stitching and some sewing and uh, hopefully some more book talk. So until then, um, I hope you're all safe and wash your hands and wear your mask.